to our latest edition by Union Solidarity International. We're absolutely delighted to be joined by Jim Stanford today, an economist at the Unifor Trade Union in Canada, which has over 300,000 members. Jim, it's a pleasure to have you with USI today. Thank you, Andrew. I'm very glad to be here. Jim, I'd really like to begin today's conversation by asking you what is the state of the Canadian economy at the moment, in particular the labour market conditions and of course is there a drive by what we would define as a right-wing government to dilute the labour laws in terms and conditions of workers in Canada? Can you just give our audience an overview, Jim? Well, the experience in Canada, Andrew, is uh, very similar. It runs parallel to the experience that has uh, occurred in other uh, developed countries, especially since the uh, financial crisis of 2008, 2009, and then the uh, austerity that came after that crisis. Uh, Canada got through the crisis a bit better than most other uh, countries, uh, partly because we didn't have any outright collapse in our banking system and uh, partly because our economy had been uh, fueled by a bit of a boom on the natural reef. Canada has a lot of oil and minerals and other natural resources. Uh, they kept the economy going when other industries uh, contracted during the, uh, during the recession. So we did have a recession and it was painful, but it wasn't certainly as bad as uh, would have occurred in America or Britain or many other uh, countries at that time. Uh, uh, but that doesn't mean everything is hunky-dory. Uh, in the years uh, since the financial crisis, uh, Canada's economy has really been kind of stuck in the mud. We've experienced much of the same stagnation, uh, slow growth, chronic high unemployment, and also underemployment, where people are technically working, but not nearly to their full capacity because they're in a part-time job or a temporary job uh, or a contract position. And uh, that condition actually hasn't gone away. In fact, it's gotten a bit worse uh, over the last couple of years as our recovery, such as it was, uh, really kind of slowed down. One of the main factors there, of course, was austerity itself. Uh, uh, we do have a right-wing federal government uh, at the national level in Canada. They have been cutting back their spending on public programs of all kinds, uh, including social services, uh, unemployment insurance, education, health care, infrastructure spending. And uh, the result of those cutbacks, of course, is less purchasing power in the economy, less job creation, and it, the public cuts actually spill over into the private labor market. So uh, really uh, nothing surprising there. Uh, Canada looks like, a lot like the other industrialized countries in the sense that we had a recession and we really still, even five, six years later, have not fully uh, recovered from that. Uh, you asked about the situation in regards to labor laws, and again, Similar to other countries, the right-wing government is trying to scapegoat unions and scapegoat labor standards uh, as somehow being the source of the problem. Uh, so we have, have seen a concerted attack on union rights, on uh, labor standards uh, by the federal government and in many of the provinces. Uh, right now, for example, we're facing a real challenge uh, from some of the uh, parts of Canada who want, want us to follow the U.S. model in terms of how labor laws uh, operate. Uh, in particular, they're interested in these uh, so-called right-to-work laws, places like Mississippi and Alabama, uh, which have virtually made unions illegal. And now there's pressure in Canada to try and do the same thing uh, as part of this race to the bottom in labor standards. Uh, so uh, the overall situation in Canada is very challenging, and this is where the, the labor movement has uh, been required to try and educate Canadians about what is the true source of the problem. It isn't unions, it isn't public services, it isn't taxes. The true source of the problem is the financial crisis that broke out and privatized the banking system, and then the right-wing response to that crisis, the austerity that's come down uh, afterwards. And uh, we're hopeful that uh, by mobilizing Canadians to defend their public services, to defend their labor rights, uh, we can push back that assault uh, by the right-wing government. Jim, that's absolutely fascinating. And we have these conversations with trade unionists and economists around the world. And what never fails to surprise me is the common themes across the world. And no matter the 
the level and degree of severity which some countries are experiencing, particularly Europe, but also America. We do have the same game being played, whether it's in Canada, or perhaps a, a more appropriate parallel could be Australia that hasn't suffered the same degrees of recession that Europe and the UK and the United States has had, but that shift towards underemployment and the precariat in terms of hiding and masking employment and unemployment figures. And you're absolutely correct in your analysis that whereby the the reason that we are in the problems today is because of the casino capitalism that wreaked havoc across the world. But yet they and the right wing and the corporations have been able to, with degrees of success, shift that on to being the fault of labour laws and the workers in general and how they need more lax and flexible working environment for these corporations. And you're absolutely correct, conversations like today are hopefully part of the process that helps educate people about the true origins of this crisis and those who are responsible. And no matter their diversionary tactics, we need to be on the game and making sure that the analysis that you gave gets a very wide audience. So thank you very much for that, Jim. I'd like to move the conversation on, if you don't mind, to your union's actual creation, Unifor, which I understand has been in existence for around a, a year and a half and it was the result of a merger between two unions in the engineering, the engineering, the energy sector should I say in paper and also the auto workers union as well. Jim can you just give us a, an analysis of how Unifor came into being and its main campaigning priorities today? Sure, Andrew. Uh, well, we're not quite a year and a half uh, old. We're still more the infant stage, I guess, than the toddler stage. Uh, Unifor was founded in September of uh, 2013. Uh, actually, on uh, on our Labor Day uh, in Canada, we celebrate Labor Day the uh, beginning of September each year, and uh, we thought that was a good day to have our founding convention. Uh, we had about 3,000 delegates and observers uh, gather in Toronto to form the new union, adopt the constitution, uh, elect our new leadership, and set our first uh, program of activities. Um, it is uh, the coming together of two uh, unions, two important unions in Canada, uh, both Canadian unions, uh, the Canadian Auto Workers Union and the Communication Energy and Paper Workers Union. Um, but it was more than a merger, I, I do stress. Uh, there was a, a strong emphasis on union renewal and union innovation as we went through the, the process. Uh, again, uh, this is a familiar story, Andrew, for anyone who studied uh, international labor relations, but the labor movement in Canada is uh, very much uh, under attack by business and right-wing governments, and we also face challenges uh, independent of that, just from the changing makeup of the economy, uh, the need to try and organize uh, workers in, um, in precarious jobs or part-time jobs or small businesses, and uh, so the union movement has to change with the times, and we thought the creation of Unifor uh, was, a, in a way, a kind of an opportunity to think hard about the challenges we face, um, think hard about the sorts of new practices, new policies, new structures that we need to put in place, uh, and kind of give a, a bit of a, a boost, a, a kickstart, a kick in the pants uh, to some of our, uh, our organizing and communication efforts. And uh, so far, anyway, we're not yet one year old. Uh, so far, it's been very uh, successful. The mechanics of uh, merging the two organizations has gone very well. Uh, we did elect uh, a whole new slate of leadership. There are new faces, very energetic uh, leaders, uh, led by our president, uh, Jerry Dias. And uh, we've also, uh, I think, really bumped up our level of activity in a number of areas. Uh, in terms of our main priorities as Unifor, uh, there's several of them. Uh, one of them obviously has to be organizing. Um, both unions uh, had experienced uh, uh, some decline in membership before the formation of Unit 4, largely because of the recession and the layoffs associated with it. Uh, now we've merged the, the two organizations, so we have a larger membership base, and that, that's helpful. But we do have to step up our organizing activities in order to make sure that uh, our membership uh, keeps pace with the labor force and that Canadians who want a union uh, can, can get one. Uh, so we've got a, a whole new emphasis on organizing. More financial resources will be committed to organizing. 
more uh, communication and research uh, resources to support organizing campaigns. And we're already seeing some payoff uh, in terms of the energy level of our organizing. Uh, we've also created a new structure in our constitution, a structure called a community chapter. Uh, whereby a group of workers who may not be in a traditional workplace, they might be freelancers or contractors uh, or even unemployed workers. Uh, any group of workers who has a common economic interest can form a community chapter of Unifor and that way be part of the broader struggle uh, of the workers' movement. They may not have, be able to negotiate a, a traditional collective agreement depending on what type of uh, uh, work situation they face, but surely they can find ways that collective action and the power of belonging to a, a union uh, can support them in their efforts. So that will be an important part of our work uh, going forward is to show that the union can be creative and flexible in the sorts of structures uh, that, that we have put together. Uh, also in terms of uh, activism and mobilization, uh, Unifor is very committed to a vision of social unionism whereby um, we're fighting not just within a particular workplace for a better contract, uh, we're fighting for a better deal for workers, period, in society. And that means getting very active in struggles around labor standards, uh, minimum wage, uh, pensions, uh, which are under attack in Canada uh, like elsewhere. And uh, Unifor very quickly has become the, uh, I'd say, the, the leading, most recognized, uh, most active uh, face of the labor movement in Canada and in, in conjunction with our uh, brothers and sisters and other unions, I think we do have a, a chance to, to step up our level of activism. Uh, we have this uh, right-wing government in Canada that's been coming after unions, but in the last year it has suffered uh, uh, some very important defeats. Uh, some of the anti-union laws that they were trying to bring through, uh, they did not succeed with, uh, partly because of the efforts of unions uh, to highlight their problems and build allies, build coalitions to stop those efforts. Uh, so I actually feel we've got a bit of momentum on our side, perhaps more momentum than I've felt uh, in the labor movement in, in, in quite a number of years. Uh, so I, I'm encouraged, and again, it's not just Unifor, it's the level of uh, activism in the whole movement in Canada. I'm encouraged uh, to what we can accomplish in the years ahead. Jim, thank you very much for those comments on Unifor's creating and its raison d'etre today, and I think one of the important points to strip out of what you said there was the element of social activism, that social movement, unionism, which is becoming increasingly important because everybody recognises that you cannot do it yourself, whether it's an individual union or the union movement. We do need to create these alliances across the board in line with people who share many of our aims and aspirations whether it's the student movement, the environment movement, and developing those coalitions, we can help each other fight for that fairer and more just world. And it's so pleasing to hear that that strategy in Canada is well underway, as it is in other corners of the world, because it is one of the ways in which we can reinvigorate our movement and also help secure the gains that we need for everybody, whether they're in the labour market or not. So that's absolutely great to hear. I'd like just to finish and conclude today's conversation, Jim, because I know you're working on a book at the moment, and uh, being an economics graduate myself, I have a perverse interest in these things, but I'm sure many of our viewers in USI have also got an interest in what your book is, and the central themes of it, Jim. So if you'd like to give us a, a synopsis of what the, the book is about, please. Oh, thank you, Andrew. Well, uh, in my job as economist with the union, uh, one of my duties is education. And that is a, a question of training our members, our activists, our local leaders in economic ideas, economic debates, economic issues, and trying to empower our side of the struggle uh, with more evidence, more facts, more confidence uh, to push for a fairer society and stronger labor standards. Because you know, whatever issue we're fighting, uh, they always try to use ec economics against us. You know, whether it's a decent contract for workers in a particular workplace, or pensions, uh, or uh, environmental rules to protect the environment, whatever it is, they always say it's not uh, feasible, it's not economically rational, uh, can't afford it. And uh, usually those arguments are wrong, and they try and uh, uh, they try and browbeat us into thinking, well, it may seem like a good idea, but we can't afford it, so we better give up the fight. 
and that attitude is uh, is quite wrong. So, in Unifor, we have a very active uh, member and activist education program, including a, a very unique uh, system where we take workers off the job, uh, we pay their lost time out of funds uh, negotiated with the employers, and we take them to our own college. Uh, it's at Port Elgin, uh, Ontario. It's a beautiful facility where they can take courses for up to four weeks on union history, uh, collective bargaining, how to be a steward, uh, and also subjects like economics, and I teach some of those courses. So as part of that work, uh, a few years ago in 2008, uh, we actually published uh, the first edition of the, of the book. This is it here. It's called uh, Economics for Everyone, and it was based on a curriculum that uh, I helped to develop for economics training for our members. But we found that it had a broader use uh, for members of other unions or community activists, uh, social activists, uh, students who are looking for an alternative to conventional economic theories, uh, even just you know an average person in society who wanted to learn more about economics from a, a kind of a, a, a common sense uh, blue collar perspective, uh, if you like, or a rank and file perspective, uh, that's a better word, uh, on economics. Uh, the idea is to present uh, economic arguments in a non-technical way, in an accessible way, uh, that reflect the interests uh, of workers and reflect the expertise of, of workers. Um, you know, the, the so-called experts on the economy are always trying to portray the rest of society as, uh, as just too, uh, too unintelligent or too untrained to appreciate why free markets are so wonderful and free trade is so wonderful and uh, government should be downsized, etc., etc. It isn't a question of lack of expertise, it's a question of what side of the tracks uh, you live on. And on our side of the tracks, the worker side of the tracks, we need to have our own uh, economics. So um, the book uh, was published in 2008. Uh, it's been used in a number of countries. It's been translated down to six uh, countries, or sorry, six languages. Uh, the global publisher is Pluto Books, which is based in uh, England. And now we've decided to write a second edition of the book to reflect all the things that have happened since 2008. Uh, namely the global financial crisis and uh, all the austerity that came after it. So the second edition of the book will be uh, published in summer of 2015, so uh, in a year and a little bit. And there'll be a whole series of pedagogical materials uh, that go with it, uh, lecture notes, student exercises, uh, extra reading, even some short films uh, for YouTube that will explain different concepts uh, in, in uh, economics for workers. The idea is to uh, say basically, uh, Andrew, Economics is too important to be left to the economists. We need to have our own economics, our own confidence in our ability to put forward economic arguments and not be tricked or defeated uh, by the ideology that we see on the stock markets and the, and the so-called uh, experts that we see on TV. And I, I'm very excited about this project. I'm very grateful that my union, uh, Unifor, has supported me in doing it. Jim, that's absolutely enlightening and uh, of course we at USI would encourage everybody to get the first edition of this book in, in advance of the second edition being published and once again you're absolutely 100% correct in your analysis in that we need to help provide people whether they are a union member or not or those who we wish to be union members with the educational tools that is digestible and accessible that helps them deconstruct the fallacy that is being presented to us by the right wing and corporations that this is somehow necessary austerity it is necessary to dilute the terms and conditions of workers that these are somehow objective empirical facts that have to be implemented when we know it to be further from the truth and in actual, this is an agenda, a subjective right-wing plot and ploy to enhance the, the profits of those at the top, the 1%, and in the process, making sure that workers are not getting a, a fairer deal as part of the price that they're willing to drive through with in order to maximise their profits around the world. So these educational tools that you're talking about, whether it's in the book, or whether it's in YouTube videos, is so important in trying to present a different vision for the world, a more fairer and just vision. And we look forward to seeing the second edition of the book, Jim, and in between that time, interviewing and speaking like today about the 
the issues and the ideas that we need to oxygenate around the world. So it just leaves me to thank you, Jim, for your contribution today. And we look forward to more conversations in the future, my friend. All right, Andrew, thank you very much. Uh, best of luck to uh, Union Solidarity International. You do a very important service for us all. Thank, thank you, you very much.